I'm Hu Hong from uh, National University of Singapore, and uh, I want to talk about the data-oriented programming and the expressiveness of uh, non contingent attacks. So this is a joint. Uh, can you go back to the? Sorry, can you go back to the first slide? Uh, okay, uh, I think I just uh, start from this here. So this is a joint work with uh, Shweta, Adrian, uh, Jinglong Pratik, and uh, Jing Kai. So nowadays, control attacks are getting harder. So given a vulnerable program with a uh, memory error, you can draw its control flow graph and the memory space in this way. Uh, so originally, attackers can place the malicious code in data section and directly jump to it. So this is a so-called code injection attack. But now in the system, we have the data execution prevention and it tries to make the data segment non-executable. So attackers, instead, are going to make the program jump to code section to reuse existing code to mount attacks. For example, this uh, uh, return to libc attack and the return oriented programming. So to, to prevent such attacks, researchers propose control flow integrity that tries to block all malicious control flow transfers. So in this way, if attackers want to build a success, successful exploit, they have to bypass uh, CFI uh, in, the, in the first place. But in our work, we want to understand, uh, uh, we want to try a new class of attacks. And we assume that the program's execution totally conforms to control flow graph. And we want to understand, in this case, what is the attack capability given an arbitrary uh, vulnerable program. So is that true? Attackers cannot do anything malicious, or they can do some specific computation. Or even worse, attackers can do anything they want, even during complete attacks. So previous work showed that attackers at least can do something uh, specific using these uh, non control data attacks. So with these attacks, attackers are going to corrupt or leak several bytes of this uh, security critical data. For example, in this uh, vulnerable code, uh, this code are going to temporarily leave to root privilege and then downgrade back to the normal user privilege. But if attackers have the ability to corrupt this uh, PWID variable, they can keep the root privilege. So similarly, in the IE browser, if attackers can corrupt this uh, safe mode flag, they can silently load the arbitrary code into the IE process for execution. So these attacks are very severe to these programs, uh, but they are very uh, special cases, and they rely on particular data or functions to build this attack. For example, this uh, user ID, uh, safe mode flag, private key, for example, to leak out. Uh, some of the attacks, for example, the control flow binding, require particular functions to build attacks, like the printf. So, but what if the vulnerable program doesn't have any critical data or functions like this? And in this case, what can attackers do? Uh, so next, I'm going to show you that the non contingent attacks can be Turing complete, and we propose uh, data oriented programming as a general way to build these uh, expressive non contingent data attacks. And these attacks are going to be uh, independent of any specific data or functions. And with this uh, DOP technique, we build real world attacks to show that they can bypass ASR without any address leakage. They can simulate a network board or even can enable code injection attacks. Okay, let's see how this is doable. So first of all, let's check this uh, simple program. This is a server program with a uh, stack-based uh, buffer flow. And uh, this one doesn't have any critical data or function here, but we want to understand what can attacks do. So uh, say attacks can want, want to do this uh, update list, this function. So can they achieve this goal? So remember that we want to guarantee the execution totally conforms to control flow graph. Okay, let's check the basic operation the malicious computation uh, has. So it has a for loop and the loop condition, the memory loading behavior, and the addition operation. So if we check the vulnerable program, actually you can find the similar computation component, a loop, a loop condition, a memory loading behavior, and the addition operation. So it seems that uh, we can use this malicious, uh, this uh, vulnerable code to simulate this malicious computation. Actually, uh, it is. Let's see how this is doable. Uh, we can draw the memory space in this way, including the stack, and the heap. So this is a legitimate uh, memory, memory layout. So if we execute this um, vulnerable code, so this is while here can be used to simulate this uh, for loop. And uh, continually, uh, we, can, we can use the memory error to corrupt the memory, uh, the stack, in this particular way. And uh, next, this, uh, this checking is interesting. So the tab is pointing to the list variable. So this one is actually going to simulate this uh, loop condition in the malicious computation. And we can make the program go to this uh, if branch, oh, sorry, this uh, else branch of this uh, condition, and this operation are going to corrupt the SRV pointing to the first object of this linked list. And this addition here is interesting. Uh, this one is going to 
simulated addition operation in, the, in this expected malicious computation. So next, the execution will go to another round of the while loop, and we can use the memory error to corrupt the stack in another way. And this time, we go to the if branch. So here, this memory loading behavior are going to simulate this expected loading behavior in the for loop. OK, so in this way, we show that with proper input, we can use this vulnerable program to simulate this malicious computation. So this technique is interesting, and we generalize this technique and propose data-oriented programming. So data-oriented programming is a general way to build a data, build a non-controlled attacks. And these attacks are going to be uh, independent of uh, any specific data or functions. And these attacks can be very expressive, even Turing complete. And DOP relies on two concepts, the data-oriented gadgets and the gadget dispatchers. So data-oriented gadgets are just x86 instructions. It's quite similar to the RP gadget. But differently, uh, we require them to be shown in the normal execution of the program, So which means in the, in the CFG. For example, in the previous code, we have this addition gadget which is a uh, line 10 in this uh, CFG. Uh, but we can see in the CFG, there, also, there are also other computations in the middle. So this, this uh, uh, unrelated operations may, may override the result. So we require that the gadgets are going to save the result in memory, which means this gadget are going to load operand from memory to the operation and then save the result in memory again. So similarly, we have the memory loading uh, gadget in the previous code. So to pass data between different gadgets, we just guarantee the memory writing address in the previous gadget are the same with the memory read address in the following gadget. So once we have the gadgets, we need to find a way to connect the different gadgets together in a particular order to build an interesting attacks. So this is the purpose of a gadget dispatcher. So gadget dispatcher are going to connect data in the gadgets legitimately regarding to the control flow graph. So it has two components. Firstly, it has a loop to make the program execution to, to go through the gadget repeatedly. And for each round of the loop, it's going to use a selector to selectively enable a particular gadget. For example, in this concrete execution, the first round of the execution are going to go to one pass and enable gadget one and three. So the next round, it'll go to another pass and enable gadget six and seven. So the third round may go through the same pass as the first one, but enable different gadget one and four. So in this way, different gadgets are connected with this particular order as the text want. So in previous code, we have this uh, while as a, as a loop and the memory error as a selector. So once we have the gadgets and the selectors, the DOP can emulate a minimal language we call the mean DOP. So in our paper, we, we prove that a mean DOP is a Turing complete language. So this means that if we can find enough gadgets and dispatchers from the vulnerable program, we can use DOP to build a Turing complete attacks. So here are the steps. So we compile the source code into LVMIR, and we do a static analysis on the LVMIR to identify the basic element. So we identify this load semantics store, this operation chain, as the gadget, gadget candidate. And also, we identify the, uh, the loops with the interesting gadgets as the as dispatcher candidate. And then we consider the concrete memory error we have, and we uh, manually select the the gadget and dispatchers to build attacks. So this part, we're planning to make it automatic. So this is a general technique to build attacks. Next, uh, I'm going to show the evaluation to show whether we can find enough gadget and dispatchers from the program and whether we can build real attacks with this technique. So we apply this technique on nine programs, including web servers, file servers, client programs. And each of these programs has at least one vulnerability from this uh, CVE database. And uh, from these nine programs, we identify more than 7,000 gadgets. And from the concrete memory error, we can reach more than 1,000 of them. So eight programs have enough gadget to simulate all mean DOP operations. So further, we identify uh, about 1,500 dispatchers from these programs. And from the concrete memory error, we can reach about uh, 110 gadgets. So this means that the basic elements of the DOP are uh, abundant in reward programs. So we confirm that two programs can be used to build Turing complete attacks. So uh, with these gadgets and dispatchers, we build three end to end attacks. So next, I'm going to go to the details of these uh, uh, attacks. So the first one, we use DOP to bypass the randomization techniques. So the previous method to bypass the randomization based on the information leakage to network. But uh, what, what I'm going to do is to bypass ASR without any leakage to network. 
and any address leakage to network. So this attack is based on the vulnerable pro FTBD file server. So this file server can use the OpenSSL for authentication. So in this case, they'll have a device chain in the program. So starting from the fixed address, they are going to go through several steps to reach this uh, randomized location of pri uh, private key. So all these uh, variables, uh, except the first one, are stored randomly. So with our DOP technique, we identify the gadgets and uh, dispatchers from the program. So including a move gadget, addition gadget, and the loading gadget. So all the red values are controlled by attackers, and the X, Y, Z are fixed values, so they are known to attackers before. Um, and this is a pseudo code of the dispatcher. So with the dispatcher and the gadgets, we can, we can achieve this uh, very basic uh, computation in this way. So we can abstract it and uh, describe it in this way. So starting from this uh, fixed address, we can find the object pointed by this value and load a particular field into the fixed location. So this is doable. And uh, we just use this basic operation and following the dereference chain, and finally we can load the randomized address of the private key into, the, into memory, into the fixed location. So next, we just find the write system call and use the move gadget to corrupt the point buffer used by write. And then finally, sorry, uh, I think this kind of out of control. Can you go back to the previous one? Uh, hello, can, can you help to go to the previous slides? Yeah, great. Okay, so finally this uh, point buffer is corrupted by, uh, by the randomized address of private key. And finally the, the content of the private key is sent out to the network. So in this attack, we didn't leak any randomized address to the network, but we still achieved the attack. And in this time, the program's execution totally conformed to the control flow graph. So next, I'm going to consider the program's existing functionality to build even severe attacks. So but first, I want to introduce some background of the DLOpen function. So this function is the interface to the dynamic linking loader. And this one is used to load a library, dynamic library, into memory space at a runtime. And uh, this one can resolve symbols and patch program due to the relocation. So on Windows systems, you have the load library function uh, similarly. So previous work shows that the dynamic loader can do arbitrary computation if they can crop this uh, alpha file. So we notice that this is also same to the DLOpen, which means if attackers can crop this in-memory structure of DLOpen, so they can perform arbitrary computation. So this is the general method. Attackers are going to send this malicious payload into memory space, corrupt this link list, and wait for the DLOpen call. So finally, the DLOpen call will do this computation for attackers. But in real-world programs, there are several challenges here. So first, the program will have a sanitization code. So some invalid code cannot be directly sent into memory space. And then another challenge is uh, the program doesn't call DLOpen at all after this memory error. So even you can have this uh, corruption correctly, but the program doesn't have the attack in the last step. So let's see how DLOpen can help here. Sorry, let's see how DOP can help here. So first, we use DOP to construct the memory, the malicious payload in memory, which means this uh, malicious uh, invalid code already inside the memory space. We just use a move gadget to construct the malicious payload in memory to bypass the sanitization. And then, and then we find a, a flag in program to decide to call the open or not. So we use DOP to craft this flag and force the program to call the open. And finally, this attack is launched with more than 700 requests to the program. So the last attack is are going to change the memory permission. So this is even severe because we know many defense mechanisms based on the memory permission. For example, DP require a non-readable code and some implementation of CFR require this uh, uh, read-only jump tables. But the existing functionality of DLOpen, the relocation, are going to, can change the permission of any page and the patch sheet and change them back. So what can we do with DOP is we can use DOP to corrupt these arguments and global variables used by DLOpen and force DLOpen to write a shell code into the code page. So in this way, the code injection is back to attackers. So uh, this evaluation shows that we can find enough gadgets and dispatchers from real-world programs, and we can build real severe attacks with DOP. So this is, uh, uh, we want to compare the DOP with the previous related work regarding whether they are tuned complete, whether they can uh, preserve CFI, and whether they are independent of specific functional data. So all Turing complete is uh, the technique that can achieve the same, uh, all the goals at the same time. So one of the related work, the print-oriented programming, which is discussed in the control flow binding work, this one is also a Turing complete non-contributed non attack. But this one requires this particular function, printf, and also this personal option to be able to build attacks. And DOP is a general technique. 
Okay, there could be uh, several potential defense mechanisms to prevent a DOP uh, attack, including memory safety and uh, DFI. Uh, but uh, due to this uh, uh, overhead or the completeness of this defense, there's no practical defense yet. I, want, I can discuss this offline if you are interested. So in summary, uh, we, we show that the non controlled attacks can be Turing complete, and we propose uh, data-oriented programming as a general way to build expressive non controlled attacks. And these attacks are independent of any specific data or functions. And we use DOP to build real attacks that can bypass ASR without any address leakage, can simulate a network board, or even can enable code injection attacks. Okay, that's all for my talk, and if you're interested, you can find more information, follow these links. Thank you. I'm ready for questions. Uh, hi, um, Patrick yeah. Hewlin, MIT Lincoln Lab. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a couple questions kind of about uh, future work. Um, first of all, do you, do you think that okay. the um, dispatcher idiom is, is, is necessary? Like, is there a way you can imagine um, sort of selectively enabling gadgets as the program continues to execute without having an explicit control flow loop? I, like, I, I realize that would probably be pretty complicated, but did you look at that at all? So, so you mean whether the dispatcher is necessary or not? Right? Yeah, like, like whether you can kind of just look at the program's continuing execution after a memory corruption, view that as a sequence of gadgets, and then figure out some way to stitch those together. Um, so in, so in to, current techniques, it's necessary because the data tech doesn't have any way to change the control flow. So if you sure. want to uh, connect a more gadget to build a meaningful attack, so the, 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 the dispatcher is a, is a useful mm -hmm. technique. So in the future, if you, if you, if you can find uh, enough gadget within one execution pass, so that is enough to build attack, then you don't need the dispatcher. But if you, have, you want to have more, uh, uh, more functionality, you'd better have a dispatcher. Okay. This is my opinion. Okay. Um, the, the, other, the other question I wanted to ask was, um, okay. do you have, uh, you, you said in the paper that there, were, uh, that there were only two out of the eight programs could have uh, Turing complete computation. Do you have any intuition about why those, the other six didn't and, and whether like, the attack could be extended or is that just kind of a function of the vulnerabilities themselves that you were looking at? Uh, sorry, which one are you referring to? Which, which, which paper? Uh, in, in your paper. In my paper, sorry, yeah, what's your question? Can I repeat again? Sorry. Um, the, the, you, you said there were, I, I think it was, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was, you said there were uh, only two out of the eight programs okay, yes. uh, had Turing complete, Turing complete yes. ability. Yeah. Um, do you have a sense for why that was and, and if your technique's extensible to make more things Turing complete, or is that just a function of okay. Uh, okay. the vulnerabilities okay. themselves? Yeah, so the question is uh, why there are only two programs have to complete the list, right? Yeah. So actually this technique is totally based on the program. So if you can find enough gadget from the program, find enough gadget and dispatcher from the program, actually you can build a Turing complete attacks. But, uh, uh, but it depends on the size of the program. Actually, some program is quite small if you, if you can check out paper. So we can cannot find enough gadget and dispatchers, so we cannot build a Turing complete attacks. I think this is quite related, uh, quite similar to, to, to RP attacks, it depends on the program. Right. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to say this is really, really cool work, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Thorsten Holtz from U Ruhr University Bochum. Um, so if I understand correctly, the Turing completeness relies on the fact that the ELF loader is Turing complete, so the weird machine by the ELF loader. So does this, imp or how would Turing completeness be achievable on Windows? Okay, so, uh, so first to clarify this one, uh, so DOP doesn't rely on any uh, ELF doesn't rely on this to build a Turing complete attacks. So just the, the last two technique, last two concrete attacks that rely on this to build attacks. Uh, so on Windows, I think they have similar, uh, similar function, as I mentioned, the load, load library, but I didn't check whether they have this functionality or not. So that, uh, that, so, uh, so that means that the, the last two, two attacks may be not possible on Windows, but I'm not sure yet. I will check it and let you know. Thank you. Andrei Pavlovsky, Ruhr University, Bochum. Um, in your first attack, you say you don't need an information leak uh, to bypass RSLR. Yes. But uh, you say you have an address, a fixed address. Where does this address come from without any information leak when you have RSLR? Okay, great. So uh, the first fixed address is, uh, is, is known to us because it's uh, inside this uh, uh, global data section. That is uh, fixed. That means uh, if the program is not compiled with the PIE option, it'll be always loaded to this uh, fixed location. 
So we're just starting from this fixed location, and the reference is a randomized location seven times, and we can finally get this uh, randomized value. So the, the most important part is to, to say that all the computations are within the memory of this uh, server program. We never leak them out. Right. So, okay.